Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Today I am here in Lake Charles, Louisiana. This is considered the Las Vegas of the South, but a lot more family friendly and kinder to the pocketbook to stay here. I am over at the Golden Nugget, but have you ever heard of Lake Charles before? Let me know in the comments down below and let me introduce you to the history and adventure packed town that this is. Lake Charles was established by Mr. and Mrs. Le Bleu of Bordeaux, France in 1781. You can still see his grave in the Bilbaum Cemetery today in Lake Charles. Unlike other areas of the South, they lived peacefully with several Indian tribes in the area. They had a family and their daughter Catherine married Charles Salier, who built their own home right here on the lake and thus the name Lake Charles came about. The town remained quite small, quiet, and peaceful until Captain Daniel Goose came in from 1855. He established a lumber mill here, and the town started to boom from there. Their main trade was with Galveston, as it was a gateway to the wild American West. The town of Lake Charles was sandwiched between Atchafalaya Swamp in the east and the Gulf of Mexico to the south, and the virgin pine and cypress forest to the north. This isolation really protected the town from other ways of thinking that plagued the rest of the South. In the 1860s, people here were still arguing about attitudes towards slavery. The 1880s saw a boom in business and traveling musicians to entertain after a hard day of labor. Since Texas had a hard stance on everything is closed on Sundays, the area became the Sunday night fiesta spot. So good parties, good music, go back a long way here. The party still continues here, even after centuries. So let's head out and see where the best spots to have activities here are. We are headed from Lake Charles over to Sulphur City to grab some coffee at the Village Coffee House and meet the mayor, Mike Danahay. It was going to be a fun filled few days and so we had to start it off right with a few coffee, teas, smoothies, scones, cinnamon rolls, avocado toast and soup. Village Coffee House has it all. They even have a drive up. So we're at the Village Coffee House place and I got the so the vanilla matcha latte with all oat milk. Oh wow. I just love matcha. So we've got the mayor of Sulphur City here and just going to tour the town and what makes Lake Charles and Sulphur City such a great place to visit for historical context of the South. After sipping our coffees for a bit, the owner came out and told us a little about, about their story of battling hurricanes and creating a positive space for the community. Yeah, so uh, again, the village opened in 2020. That was uh, in June of 2020, so we were in the midst of the pandemic. We had already start, started kind of rolling towards opening, and so we did open. Um, and then, of course, in August, we had uh, Hurricane Laura that impacted us. It actually took out this front wall. And then in, uh, the next storm, Delta took off our side wall. So 2020 was a very challenging time uh, to start the business. But the whole reason we started in this community, this is an under-resourced part of our community. We realized one of the things that we needed was jobs, and we needed a positive place for community. We created jobs. We created a great place for community. Um, and coffee and wonderful food is the way that we do it. What was really cool to see was the mayor of Sulphur City along with a longtime journalist and our historian, Adley, who would take us through the Charpentier district later in this video, so make sure to stay tuned. But watching them share stories and the love of this city was such a special moment, as well as the citizens that came here to enjoy this positive space. This was my first time ever meeting a mayor and shaking their hand, so I did kind of geek out a little bit, but the guy was so nice. Mayor, would you like to give Oh, yeah, thank y'all. I appreciate y'all being here today. Uh, welcome to downtown uh, Sulphur. Anyway, we're, uh, we're happy to see that Lake Sulphur and Lake Charles are starting to kind of come back from that storm-related process, and it's uh, it's still a challenge for all of us. It's still a lot of things that need to be taken care of. Uh, but we also see opportunity, and that's exciting for us. Uh, we're seeing new businesses take interest in Sulphur. Uh, we're actually reaching out to them, 
encouragement to be here. Uh, they are starting to locate here. We're excited about that. We see the growth that's taking place. Uh, and so we're, we're going to continue to work with our partners uh, in the community to be able to facilitate that and make that happen here in Sulphur. So uh, welcome, everybody. And we hope that you enjoy your visit and come back to see us sometime. Follow me. People really underestimate these small towns. It really gives you a sense of what communities should be and you don't have the hustle and bustle. I mean, I am right here by a, a major stoplight, which is one of the few in the city, but being here and, and seeing the, the camaraderie and how much these people have been through with the hurricanes and the frosts and the different storms and, and just how truly connected they all are. This is why I do what I do is to meet people like this and experience places just like this. I was truly moved by the sense of community, not just in Sulphur City, but in Lake Charles in general. Alas, all thing, good things must come to an end, so it was on to the Flock of Five Emporium, where local handicrafts are sold from artisans from the city. They had some great Mardi Gras costume accessories. If you haven't checked out my videos on Mardi Gras in Lake Charles, a family-friendly event in the Iowa Chicken Run, be sure to go check that out. After meeting this lovely couple who were celebrating the first day of Lent, it was on to take the tour with Adley. This is Adley. He was taking us through the Sharp and Cheered Historic District tour and I swear this guy is like a walking encyclopedia about everything Lake Charles. West Cal and uh, the West Cal Chute area is part of the no man's land strip in Louisiana. After the Louisiana Purchase, uh, this edge of Louisiana, this part of Louisiana was not really part of the Purchase. And because of that, it was a land wild and woolly. It's the era of Jean Lafitte, for example. And Jean Lafitte was able to be here because he was able to to operate in the open. He wasn't breaking any laws because this was the lawless corner of, of, of everything. Not the Spanish Empire, not the United States, just unknown territory. Actually, officially no man's land for about uh, 40 years. What it meant was that no militia or taxmen or bean counters would come into this area to say anything about anything. So people operated pretty much as they will. And many of the early pioneers in Southwest Louisiana, County Parish particularly, um, have that as part of their DNA. They're slightly ornery and they don't cotton to authority. So it, it makes for it makes for an interesting development because most places are settled and you know the Puritans get everything in order. But here it's very, very much wild and woolly, and it's still pretty much wild and woolly when it comes to certain things. This was not part of the plantation economy, uh, Southwest Louisiana. Uh, essentially was cattle country. This is where the West really starts. They, Texas says it starts in Fort Worth. It doesn't. It starts actually in Southwest Louisiana because of the 1700s. This part of, of Louisiana where we have wide prairies and marshes uh, was a place where you raised cattle. And the cattle were branded. They were set out to, to uh, graze on the prairies and the, the marshes. And then they were gathered up a couple times a year and then uh, taken by trail rides, literally trail rides, to New Orleans or to Opelousas, which were the closest cities that were markets to the to the east. So uh, it's uh, it's not part of the typical South. It's very much its own thing. And uh, because of that, you'll notice, well, if you were running around with the, the Courier de Monte Gras, you'd see a lot of horsemanship. Uh, cowboys and sawmills and Jean Lafitte, the only place in America where cowboys and pirates regularly interacted. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen the uh, Imperial Calchi Museum, but that particular building is on the site of one of the pioneer homes here, and uh, it's where pirates actually interacted with cowboys. They exchanged uh, pirate goods for beef and for uh, salt beef and pork and whatnot, and they made their exchanges there. So 
cowboys and pirates have barbecues in southwest Louisiana. It's not a bad theme. Uh, those of you who are interested in women's history, you can know that the last woman executed in Louisiana in the electric chair was electrocuted in that building there. This is where she committed her crime. This is where she did her time. This is where she got her, her zap. Her name was Tony Joe Henry. And this is, uh, what crime did she commit? She actually murdered a man. Uh, okay. If you want to hear the whole story, you can actually Google Tony Joe Henry. And it, the story is like a soap opera, uh, 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 you know, country western song soap opera. It's phenomenally complicated. After regaling us with stories of lawyers, cowboys, pirates, and the last women executed, it was on to the Charpentier District. The Charpentier District is known for its gorgeous homes that once belonged to the lumber millmen who were able to furnish and build their homes with the lumber that they got from the mills. And boy, were they wealthy. Uh, this, the houses that are on the left here actually are properties that go through to the water. And you'll see the boat houses on the water uh, all of these boathouses are constructed with with uh, Corps of Engineers permission because they have this is a navigable waterway. This is one of the more interesting houses. This house looks like it would be in England somewhere. Oh, nice. Scottish yes. baronial, kind of cool. Again, we lost forty percent of our trees. So imagine this with more trees and shade. One of the older houses on the street is this one coming up. This pale gray one. That's actually an eighteen eighties house, which is a. a uh, old for this part of town, the oldest house in town. Part of the house includes the 1830s um, cabin that was built here by the Barb uh, ancestors. Historically, it's known as the Krause Burton House because two, two big pioneering families, the Krause and the Burtons, lived in this particular house. It's uh, 1925 it was constructed. Mrs. Stream is also known, very known for the, being the owner of several Fabergé eggs that are on permanent display in New York and in New Orleans. Uh, there used to be very extensive gardens here which were knocked back in the storm. Before jails were actually made, this home housed the prisoners of Lake Charles. And there is a story that goes that one of the few of the prisoners tried to escape jumping from the top floor to their death. And they still haunt it today. The other interesting thing I found was that sometimes some of the houses, of the lumber houses, they would paint their ceilings of their porches blue to try to confuse the bugs to not nest there. If you get a chance to take a tour of the Charpentier District, I highly recommend that you get one either with Adley or another historian to really get the meaning behind the places, spaces, names, and homes. But it's time to go explore a playground, and not just one like this children's playground, that if you want to take a break from the festivities of the city with your kids, this is a massive playground I highly suggest that you visit. But I'm talking about another playground, a nature's playground at the Creole Nature Trail. We're here at the Creole Nature Trail. Now this is a free place that you can come learn about the wildlife, this 180 mile trail with, it's one of only 57 roads that's considered an all American road. So in order to do this trail, you wanna give yourself at least a full day to explore. Let's go check this out and some of the species that you can find here in Louisiana. Along this nature trail, you will have over 400 species of birds, alligators, and 26 miles of the natural Gulf of Mexico beaches. Try your hand at fishing, crabbing, where you can catch some speckled trout, redfish, black drum flounder, and anyone over 16 must have a fishing license, so be sure to grab that before heading on the trail. They do have options for both freshwater and saltwater fishing, which means it makes this a really unique area for surf fishing and it's world class.
Now the Creole Nature Trail does have an app that you can download on your phone. So make sure to download that so you get all of the details and a guided tour of this area. So in 2020, Hurricane Laura actually destroyed several of the man-made structures along the trail. So make sure you come prepared with food, water, and gas. It isn't just the Creole Nature Trail that this building teaches about. They also teach about Zydeco music and its roots and history in Lake Charles, as well as a delicious delectable called Boudin, which is where we're headed to next. I'm taking you to another foodie hotspot. Insane sausages. Why are they insane? Because of all of the different flavors you can put in there. And you can hear the cars behind me here because this is the perfect road trip hotspot right along I-10. He is the winner of multiple awards. Let's go check out this delicious food. That's my, that's my helper. There's my little, uh-oh. You didn't see, he didn't see himself turn that corner. This is Miles. I got another helper around here, he's a little older. There's my other helper. This is Cameron. I was working in the plants in Houston and uh, I was just making a lot of this crazy stuff on the side and bringing it to the, uh, to the job sites and stuff. And then it kind of started ex expanding and people were like, how crazy can you get with it? Uh, it started growing and kind of ballooning. It started to get to the point where I was making and producing so much that uh, I decided to give it a shot. So uh, for some crazy reason, you could put piece any two English words together and there's a dot com, but insane sausages was not taken. So I couldn't believe it. I'm like, maybe this is fate. So I, uh, I bought the website, I bought the LLC and that was in 2015. We started opening this thing up and I was fortunate since the day we've opened the building, we've had a steady clientele. Uh, we take a lot of pride in what we do. Everything is made in here if we can do it. For the most part, everything's brought in on trucks. We debone them, we grind them, we mix them, we stuff them, we smoke them, all of, all of which you'll be able to see a little bit of that process today. So, uh, man, that's tough. It's like, which kid do I like better? I don't know. Uh, now, uh, the crawfish bowl one has, we, we opened that one up about a month ago and it has excelled beyond. It, it, it way out uh, sells anything else. The next one, which you'll try here today, is gonna be a Steen's syrup sausage. So Steen's is a cane syrup that's made in Louisiana. And uh, we mix that, we incorporate that into the sausage. So it kind of eats like a breakfast sausage. That's our number two. And then of course the boudins really do well here too, because everybody's kind of familiar with that around this location. So those are probably our top three that I would say, all of which you'll get to try today. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to eat a boudin ball. Now, before you get crazy with that idea, all it is is that you take some of this boudin, roll it up, fry it up. I mean, what doesn't taste better fried, right? And you put it with some delicious sauce. Mmm, so good. So this is the pork enchilada boudin ball. Okay, here we go. Delicious, juicy, flavorful, smoky. Mmm. So delicious. It's got like a sweet flavor and the spicy. And oh, you have to stop by and say the sausages. Now that we filled ourselves up with boudin, we're gonna go head over to Crying Eagle for some brews. Opened in 2016, this brewery had a unique vision. Located in Calcasieu, Paris, this 4,000 square foot tap room has an indoor seating area made for sampling beers in a very unique way. Let's go take a look.
this is where we make the beer, okay? And I'll start. Does anybody know how many ingredients it takes to make beer? I'll give you a hint. About because I put my fingers up. Good call. Four. <laughs> anybody can name them. Wheat, yep, grain, great, and? Sugar. Nope, that is yep. grains come, that's right. Sugar comes from the grains. Yeast. 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 Got it. All right. So it starts with water. We do use City of Lake Charles water, which is why we have a, uh, a water treatment system that includes uh, UV, carbon filtration, and reverse osmosis to get the water to nearly pure H2O. Our brewers will then add in certain salts and minerals based on the kind of style that they, he's looking to make. I'd never actually been to a brewery before, so all of these knickknack, tallywhack, wires, gadgets, gizmos, and everything was so fascinating to me. I have no clue what any of it really does, but all I knew is that what came out of the tap was mighty fine and definitely delicious. If you head out to the beer garden, you can grab a pizza and your beer, and they don't have just food there. During the summer, they have tunes and People come by, the place is packed with music. They also have games that you can play underneath umbrellas as you eat your pizza. All right, so we're digging in to the Boudin balls here at Crying Eagle. These are good, but I still love the insane sausages, Boudin balls. Yeah, yeah. All right, so this is the Crying Eagle pizza. It's got pear and cheese and bacon. I thought when you're crying eagle, why not give a crying eagle pizza, right? There's a little rosemary in there, but it's got that sweet and savory, which is perfect for me. Love that. All right, so we got Don't Blush here. That's a raspberry passion fruit. Oh, that's so good. It's sweet, so it doesn't taste like a normal beer. I'm gonna finish this up at my lunch. I'll see you guys at the next stop. Our next stop was over to the 1911 Historic City Hall Arts and Cultural Center, where Carol Gale was going to give us a tour of the temporary and long-term exhibits that are on display. Reserved for posterity. Um, then they said, now we have this gorgeous building. What are we gonna do with it? The, the, the 90s. Um, to turn it into an arts and cultural center. And it has been that for 17 years now. I've been here from day one. My name is Carol Ann Gale, and I'm the exhibit and program specialist here. And we bring in exhibits. I love to find something to supplement it, whether it be an arts demonstration, an artist's gallery talk, um, a film, you name it, we've done it all. So uh, let's go on into this beautiful building. This building served as the seat of the Lake Charles city government until 1978. After it underwent extensive reconstruction, it now has three galleries of rotating exhibits to feature artists, including Pablo Picasso and many others. What we have here, this is uh, one of the traveling exhibits. This is called Flamenco. And Flamenco comes to us from uh, arts, uh, International Arts and Artists exhibit that tells the story of flamenco from Spain to the U.S. where people can come in and they can uh, listen to tutelage about how to play the cajon, the Cajun, I mean the drum. Um, they can play castanets. Uh, they can try on costumes and do photo ops in front of our magnificent horse. The whole city celebrates very much like Mardi Gras here with parades and, and music and dance and, uh, and costuming and um, uh, food. They share food and they set up these cassettas. This is my, uh, my meager attempt at creating a cassette in this very small space. They would decorate it as if you were coming into their living room and they'd serve you food. Paella is the traditional dish, dish served um, during flamenco season, and it's done in a huge copper pot, and it's a, a rice dish very akin to our jambalaya here in Louisiana. In fact, um, paella came before jambalaya, and, and we've adopted that. 
Uh, it's, it's not seasoned with hot spices like our jambalayas are. It's seasoned with saffron. So it has this lovely golden color and you can use seafood in Spain since they're, they're a peninsula that has sea on most three sides of the country. Um, paella is usually done with seafood, various seafoods, but you can do it with chicken, you can do it with beef and sausages and things like that. I had a, a group come from Houston. Houston has a large population of flamenco. You know, you're nodding your head. Uh, as, and so does the Southwest United States, New Mexico. Oh, it's everywhere. They came from Houston and performed upstairs in the main uh, exhibit that you're going to see. We're going to go up there next. Um, and they performed, they danced and sang. And so we had paella and empanadas. And oh, it was wonderful. It was then on up to the flamenco exhibit where the old costumes and history of where flamenco came from and where you can find it in the U.S. was. Oh. Um, these are some of the earlier costumes. Uh, flamenco is sort of a cultural event that was shared among a private event shared among families and close-knit communities. Uh, there was dancing, like I said, and food and music and storytelling, that oral histories passed down in those, in those communities. It was celebrated by Gitano people. The Gitano people came to Spain in the second century, um, but um, they still exist today. And during the um, 15th and 16th centuries, uh, King Ferdinand, decided he wanted to try to unite Spain. There were 50 um, provinces in Spain, all different cultural units, basically. And um, they, it wasn't working. So he, his big idea was to unite it under the Catholic Church. Well, that didn't work. The Gitano people were herders and they lived free on the land. And they liked that. They did not want to change that, that part of their culture. So they escaped, well escaped, they were driven to the, in the southern part, southwestern part of France, uh, southeastern, I'm sorry, of uh, Spain. There are caves, many caves in the mountains, and that's where the Gitano people went. And they started to live in those caves and celebrate the way they would like to with their music and and, um, but, but to this day, the caves that they went to are still owned by those families and they're passed down from generation to generation. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, this is a, a wonderful old photograph of uh, they're inside a cave and you see all those copper pots on the wall. Those are paella dishes. If somebody got married, you'd give them a paella dish, you know. If you celebrated some sort of a great event, a birth or whatever, you'd get a paella dish. And so this is a wonderful collection. I love that photograph. When the Gitanos came, they brought influences with them from Eastern Europe, as well as Greece, the Middle East, Persia, India, even as far East is India, and I think this costume has an Indian feel to it, doesn't it? It even has a Greek feel to it. The pleats and the skirt, um, it's just wonderful. And so it's, it's very much like what's happening in the world still. You know, we're a melting pot of refugees still coming and bringing their ideas, their cultural influences, um, and the, the um, Gitanos did the same thing. Um, this is a wonderful, all these costumes, these are very old costumes from the 1800s. And these are all handmade, beautifully embroidered with gold thread and uh, sequins and things, a matador's outfit. But I would rock that jacket today with a pair of jeans. <laughs> Without a doubt, you would too. Look at this one. This is exquisite. The hand, the hand work on this. It just blows my mind. It's phenomenal. Starting in Hollywood, and then when flamenco took off as a performance art, it was it was done in theaters and uh, festivals and all over the country. I mean, it just it's still going on today. New uh, New Mexico has a nightclub called El Nido, and that nightclub 
started in the 1920s with evening performances of flamenco music and vocalists and dancers, and it's still going on today in the same place, this little tiny hole in the wall nightclub, uh, El Nido, if you're ever, uh, it's, it's outside of um, Albuquerque. If you're ever there, go, just do yourself a favor and, and enjoy flamenco real traditional flamenco it's wonderful because the costumes have quite a bit of weight to them just being so agile and moving that around you know it just shows their strength and power in the movement be sure to check out the black heritage gallery where black artists are able to exhibit some of their work that have inspired them from their cultural heritages It was then on over to the Luna Bar and Grill, where it was once a former music hall turned artisanal restaurant. Creamy, you get that freshness of the spinach inside of it, and man, really good flavors. And this is the crawfish bread. Oh man. The flavor of the crawfish really comes through with that one. How are you guys doing? It's great. It's, well, great. Well, it's all universal stuff. It's either, it's either family members or planets or music. And that was probably our most popular Yeah. Is she your most popular uh, child? Kid? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's the middle, so she's the toughest. Okay. <laughs> to, to deal with and the toughest to deal with. Ow. All right, well, I got this on video now, so yeah, you know. It's, it's, it's out there. Yeah. <laughs> After ordering a few of their suggestions for drinks and meals, we collaborated as a group and were able to try several dishes and desserts. And I'm telling you, it was a 10 out of 10. I know we just scratched the surface on all of the things there is to do in Lake Charles. The culture here is so rich, the people are so friendly, and there's a resilience that's a little bit hard to describe. But if you were able to get down to Lake Charles in the summer, there are a few things I wasn't able to cover in this video I wanted to mention. Like the live concerts at La Berge or golf at Golden Nugget. You can kayak along the casinos and grab drinks at, at the casinos along the way. They have the Summer Pirate Festival, the Boudin Trail, the Brews and Spirits Trail, and the Mardi Gras Festival. Make sure to go check those videos out that I already put out on that. And at the very least, just sit and relax on the beach and take in the warm Southern heat. No matter where you decide to go or what you decide to do in Lake Charles, I guarantee you're not only going to have a great time, but you'll be moved by the people that live here. To finish up our video, we are leaving you at Villa Harlequin, which is a restaurant that is owned by the mayor of Lake Charles. Who we also got to meet, Nick Hunter, the mayor of Lake Charles, Louisiana. This guy is a pistol, but very nice. No, really excited to have you here. A lot of, um, a lot's different in Lake Charles versus a year and a half ago, but we're trying to focus on the good stuff. And we feel like we've got a lot of good, positive things happening right now. Still some, some recovery that's needed, but can't only focus on that, we gotta focus on the good stuff too. Did I geek out at meeting another mayor? Yes, I did. Don't judge me. 
So I am here at Villa Harlequin, the last stop in things to do in Lake Charles. This is a blend of Italian and steakhouse dishes with a Louisiana twist. And I can't wait to dive into this grub. Combining forces with my fellow travel bloggers, we had a combination of shrimp risotto, hanger steak, seafood, and so much more. All right, here's the gnocchi. Oh man. It's rich, creamy, with a little bit of a tomato base. So good. I had to let a belt loop out after this meal and all of the delicious meals that I had while in Lake Charles. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this little tour of Lake Charles. Make sure you come down and visit all of these hot spots. And what do they need to do? Come to Lake Charles! <laughs> See y'all in the next one. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share it with a friend because it helps me out and more the merrier.